Hey, this is His Word Unveiled. We are in the book of 1 Samuel. This ministry is all about reading with purpose. Not just to read, not just to finish a reading plan, but to read with purpose and to be changed, to allow God to, to give His Word to us, to speak to us, and for things to change within us. It actually changes us, that we are awakened to the truth that God gives us, and things happen in our lives. That's what this is about, is, is just being disciplined, being obedient, getting in the Word, and reading with purpose. Reading for something to happen, for God to happen to and in us. So our reading today is 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. We're combining both of these chapters together. We're going to read. We're going to let God overwhelm us. We're going to learn something. We're going to grow in this. And I believe that the truth that we gather today, that, that we... Um, receive today through the reading in these two chapters, I believe that it's going to be just a part of the bigger plan that God has for us and holding on to this truth and allowing Him to change it, to transform it into something that will will drive us into meaning, that will drive us into a purposeful, abundant life where other people will be impacted as well. This change needs to happen, that, that good change, that change in the bad being gone and change in the good, replacing it and us being moved, being more intimately connected to the Lord. That's what His Word Unveiled is all about. So 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22 is our reading. So this is the time when you hit pause and you go meet with the Lord, that you read expecting God to do something. You read allowing God to do things within you as you read, as His truth comes alive to you. So meet one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. Go just a quiet quiet time, quiet moment with Him in like a secret hiding place, just you and God, just one-on-one. -on -one. And take a few moments and read and let Him have His way. Let Him show you, let Him speak to you, let Him move you and cause change and transformation to happen within you. With that, you're going to read, I'm going to pray, and let's get this thing started. Let's move forward into all God has for us today through these chapters specifically. Oh, Father, we love you and we, we praise you. We thank you for loving us and caring about every detail in our lives, for desiring for us to be um, exposed to all that you have, to all that you are. Your desire is for us to meet with you. Your desire is for us to be free of all the junk, of all the restlessness, of all the things that we deal with. Not that we escape those things, but that in those things, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of those attacks coming, that we, that we know peace, that we have hope, that we know you, that we're intimately connected with you through and in everything. Father, thank you. Thank you for drawing us in. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the change that happens in your presence. Lord, we just pray that you meet with us today as we walk through these chapters. Overwhelm us. Speak to us. Teach us. We just, we're just praying for change to happen. That even if we're good with you, even if we're so connected with you, we're just we're just speaking that we want more. We're just, we're asking that you give us more of yourself, that that change, that it's a consistent changing, a consistent growing, a consistent seeing you. Father, we love you. Meet with us today and teach us something new and amazing, so full of truth and power. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 21. So the chapter before we heard... Um, found out, discovered, whatever, that Saul is after David. Saul wants to kill David. Now Saul's son, Jonathan, Jonathan and David are like the bestest of best friends. Their relationship is so, it's just so authentic. It's sincere. It's just giving of oneself, loving each other more than they love themselves. This beautiful friendship of, of just commitment and just togetherness, a real bond. And we see that Saul is wanting to kill David. So Jonathan and David are grieved that now David has to run for his life. He has to flee because Saul is after him. And Jonathan helps him get away. Um, we see in that last verse in the last chapter, he says, Go in safety, and as much as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. So that's what left off in the last chapter, the last video that we went over, that David 
um, fled, that he went on his way, a separate way, and Jonathan stayed back with his father. So chapter 21, then it says that David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, who is the priest at this time. So he meets with Ahimelech. He, um, it says, Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? So he's all concerned. Here's David coming by himself. What's going on? Just this feel, this awareness that something's not right. Something's going on. Then David reaches out to the priest and asks, um, asks him for just provisions, just for bread, for anything that he has. Um, and we see that Ahimelech, the priest, he says there's no ordinary bread on hand but there is consecrated bread. So this bread that they have set out um, for the Lord, this consecrated, this holy bread. And after so long, we read clear back in um, Exodus or Leviticus, I think Exodus, where after a certain time they baked fresh bread. So there was always bread sitting out on the table of showbread. They baked fresh bread and then they had this consecrated bread left over. And this was the bread that was given then to David, that the priest said, this is all the bread we have, but yes, here, here is this bread um, for you, take this. So as David is meeting with Ahimelech, the priest, as they're together, as he, as Ahimelech is providing David with this consecrated bread and, and blessing him and being, you know, being there for him, giving him what he needs, it says in verse seven, now one of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. So now we know that Saul has eyes that are watching, that, that is seeing, he knows what's going on between David and Ahimelech. Not only does he know where David is at, but he sees this connection, he sees the priests helping David, this man who is running from the king. So that will come up later on in the story. So then David asked Ahimelech, now is there not, this is verse 8, now is there not a spear, a sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's matter was urgent. Then the priest said in verse 9, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. So then David takes the um, the sword of Goliath that he used to kill Goliath. So now he has bread that was provided for him, the consecrated bread, and now he has the sword of Goliath with him as he goes on um, his journey. So in verse 10, it says, Then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. So this is the Philistine territory that he runs to. But then it says, the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they dance, saying Saul is slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? So they know, hey, this is the dude that killed Goliath. This is the dude that killed a whole bunch of people. And people sang about him that he's even greater than Saul. His victories are even greater than Saul's. And so they see him alone. So David could very well be in danger. And David is aware of this. So what does he do? He acts like he's crazy, right? Like any other person would do, right? He just acts insane so that they leave him alone. And that plan paid off. Um, so it says in verse 13, So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. He was acting like a crazy man. Then Achish, the king, um, the king of Gath, then said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? So he's saying, I've got enough madmen in in my land, in this city that I deal with. Why why are you bringing this one to me? So David's little plan there, I guess, acting insane gets you out of being killed by the Philistines. So then it takes us into um, chapter twenty two. So David continues to move. He continues to journey on. He continues, continues to flee from Saul. So verse 1 of 21 says, So David departed from there, from, um, from Gath, and escaped to the cave of, Adul cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress 
and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over captain over them now there were about 400 men so these were all these were the mess ups these were the guys the people struggling these were the outcasts these were the ones you know in debt dealing with stuff struggling stressed out discontent with things um you know all of these guys then gathered to David. They heard of David, that he was in this cave of Adullam, that they come to him. There are 400 guys. So right now, David knows that he was anointed king. Like, long time ago, seems like. Um, the youngest of his family, Samuel comes, finds him over all of his strong, big, older brothers. The Lord says, nope, not him, not him. Goes to David, anoints David in the presence of his brothers, the word tells us. So he knows this. He knows that he was anointed king. He knows the call that God has on his life. But he's in this waiting process, this long waiting process. Not only does he know that he's going to be king, but now he knows, fully aware, that the present king is after him to kill him, to destroy him. So he is hiding away in this cave, and 400 men gather then, are now underneath David's rule in a sense that they're following him that they have have pledged their support to him so 400 men and David then are up um, in this cave verse 3 says and David went from there to Mizpah of Moab and he said to the king of Moab please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me then he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold then we um, hear about this prophet Gad. So the prophet Gad goes to David and says to him, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So we see this, God um, using people. I mean, we see the provision. This, So many people are supporting David and people are coming alongside David. But this is the Lord. Like we cannot, we can't see this as just, oh, there's so many really good people who are supporting David, who believe in David, who, who see his strength, who see, you know, maybe beyond what other people see that there's something with him that, that, hey, you know, not knowing he was anointed king, but there's something on the sky. There's an anointing upon him. We see, oh, there's so many good people, but we have to understand this is God. This was God who, who impressed upon Ahimelech's heart to give him bread, to provide him bread, to provide him that sword, those weapons, to be equipped, to be in, um, you know, in movement, in action, and to be provided for. We even see the prophet Gad that, that he is getting a word, no, depart from there and go here, that God is directing him. And in our lives, when we, when we have direction, when wisdom is given to us, when people are speaking life into us, we have, yes, we can be so grateful for the people around us. We can say thank you and be all about, you know, all about what's happening. But may we always see God in, in all of that. May we only see God in all of that. That God's goodness comes through sometimes a word from people, a, a word of life or encouragement that's coming from other people. That's the Lord. That's the Lord that's put it on their heart, that's put that within them to speak to us, that we can be so grateful for the people in our lives. But may we be ultimately grateful for the Lord who sent those people, who spoke that word, who is the encouragement that we are hearing through other people, the beauty that we're seeing all around us. That's all from God. Everything, every good gift, every Every good thing, everything that we have, that everything that we've been blessed with, we've been blessed with by God because He is the blesser. And we can't keep our eyes focused on the blessing, on even the person who gives the blessing, but on the Lord who created that person to give that blessing. It all comes from the Lord. All of it. So the prophet Gad then is speaking this and giving direction to David um, that the Lord is watching out for him. The Lord is leading him. Okay, so then in verse 6, then Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. So Saul's catching word of what's going on. Um, he gets upset because he is saying, hey, everybody's conspiring against me. Everybody knew that my son made a covenant with David, that he helped him get away, and nobody's talking to me. So verse 9, it says, then Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said... Remember, he was the eyes. He was the 
um, shepherding then, it says he was part, he was Saul's shepherd in that city where he saw David go to Ahimelech. So Doeg the Edomite, um, Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. So he then relayed, he gave him provisions, he gave him the sword of Goliath, he was in full support of him, and um, relaying that he didn't speak a word to Saul. So verse 11, this obviously did not make Saul very happy. It says, Then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's household, the priests who were in Nob, and all of them came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. So Ahimelech presented himself and said, Okay, what's up? What do you need? Um, he says then, Why have you... And the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day. In verse 14, Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, even the king's son-in-law who is captain over your guard and is honored in your house? Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. So he's saying, whoa, you think I just started supporting David? No, we know who David is. We know that the Lord is with him. We know his obedience and, and the valiant warrior that he is. We know the things that he's accomplished through the strength of the Lord. Ahimelech said, if you think that I'm just now providing for David, that I'm just now going to the Lord, inquiring the Lord for him, then you're crazy. There's, I have been doing this because I see that the Lord is with him. And Ahimelech speaks in such um, boldness and in praying for David and fearlessly standing up for David in his obedience and in his walk with the Lord. Love this. Love that Ahimelech didn't back down. He didn't say, oh, oh, well, he forced me or he made me. No, it was in this boldness and saying, I know what's right. I know who David is, and yes, I supported him, and yes, I've been praying for him, and yes, I've been, I've been speaking blessing over him. Love that boldness. May we be like that, that we don't fear men coming at us and saying, you know, did you do this, or how, how can you be there, whatever it is. May we be so bold and stand with authority and say, look, I know that person, and I know the Lord, and I know what God's doing, and I know what the Word says, and I know this is right. May we stand in boldness just as Ahimelech did. But in this response, Saul did not like it, did not appreciate it. And we see in verse 16, But the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand also is with David. And because they knew that he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priest of the Lord. So Saul, we see in this anger, again, this is stemming from jealousy. This is stemming from his own shame, his own insecurity, because Saul disobeyed. Because Saul got this word that God was not happy with him, that he was taking the kingdom from him. So he's upset at himself. He's, he's sulking in shame, which is causing this bitterness and this anger to rise up. Then he sees as his kingdom, as his, his honor to the people and favor among men and God is decreasing, that another man, David's, that his is increasing. Therefore, all of this bitterness, all this shame and insecurity that he feels about himself, this lack of confidence, this anger and this bitterness starts triggering towards David and his jealousy and saying, whoa, whoa, now he's getting all attention as I'm losing, you know, I'm losing favor, I'm losing popularity, I'm losing all of this. And just out of jealousy, just out of this anger, he decides to kill anybody who helps him. He decides to put down anybody who's trying to help, who's trying to benefit, who's trying to speak encouragement and life into David. We just see, we see what this does to us in our humanness. Anger, if we hold anything against another, if we're out to glorify ourselves, what this does and the decisions. He told the men to kill the priest. They said no, they weren't willing to put their hands toward the priest. But then there's one very special person who decides, hey, I can do it. I can be that evil. I can be that full of wickedness. In verse 18, then the king said to Doeg, you, you turn around and attack the priest. 
And Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests. And he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. Doeg unashamedly um, took orders from Saul and killed 85 priests so Saul could feel better about himself. That is so heartbreaking. That is, that is, that's just sad. That's just, that's just sad. I have no other word. I have no other words. That's just, we just see, we just see the junk when it's not taken care of, when we don't go to God, when we don't just rest in peace and trust the Lord and seek Him, but we just react. We react out of our emotions. We react out of this anger. We react out of this fear. And in 80 five men died because Saul was jealous because Saul was was upset that someone was doing better than he was you know we can look at that and say how childish but how many times have we been in that position how many times with our words and our thoughts have we killed other people have we destroyed other people with the way that we speak of them with the way that we've spoken to them with the way that we've treated them the lord doesn't take sin lightly and we we saw we see in the old testament where it says that if a man hates his brother if he feels anger towards his brother if there's if there's just this um this resentment and this bitterness toward them this jealousy towards them if we hate our brother if we don't want what's best for them, if we want to see them fall, then that is the same as murder in the eyes of the Lord. How many times have we murdered 85 people? 85 people who are trying to serve the Lord, who are living for the Lord and we get jealous and we allow what we're lacking, what we're feeling, what we're seeing to, to drive us into hurting other people. It's so devastating but may the Lord just grip our hearts and really cause us to evaluate how are we speaking to others and when we speak of them are we putting them down just so we can be lifted higher are we so focused on making sure that we are higher that we are we wording things where it drops people down just a little bit so we can remain above now we don't have to be crazy ahead but if we're just a little bit ahead that's where we need to be are we focused on that and making sure we sound good in front of others that we look better than others, that we're pointing out their mistakes. It's, it goes that simple. Like that may be radical thinking. I mean, we're seeing this one man kills 85 men, like literally physically kills 85 men because of this jealousy. And I'm comparing how we think about others and talk to others. You're thinking, are you serious, Melissa? Yeah, I am. I'm absolutely serious. Because if we don't take, if we don't take his commands and, and this stuff that seriously, then nothing's gonna change then we'll brush everything off. And as long as we're not actually killing someone, we're fine. As long as we're not actually doing this, we're fine. As long as we're actually not, you know, stuck in this type of addiction, then we're fine. We can't brush anything off. We have to take everything we do so seriously. We can't just say it's no big deal because it's not as bad as this person. Everything that we do, every thought that goes against the word of God needs we need repentance for that do we like we have to be so connected to the lord that anything that comes up <coughs> that we can take everything seriously that we want everything changed in our lives utterly destroying everything in our lives that sets itself up against the lord and that includes putting people down it should be about glorifying the lord and wanting those people who are ahead of us, who, who are doing a better job than us, per se, and what we see, we want them to succeed. If it's going to glorify the Lord, then we want them to succeed. Even if we're last in the, in the line. Even if we're the last one chosen for a team. If we're that last one, as long as we're glorifying God and the way that we're building other people up, then yes, let's, let's live that way. Let's absolutely. It's got to come down to glorifying God and not ourselves. So 85 men, 85 priests are killed by Doeg the Edomite under the command of King Saul. Verse 19 says, And he struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants, also oxen, donkeys, and sheep he struck with the edge of the sword, all out of rage because that city, because men in that city, the priests in that city, helped Saul's enemy. That's what it comes down to. Verse 20 says, But one son of Abimelech, Ahimelech, sorry, 
the son of Atub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. So Ahimelech, all of his family, they were killed, all the priests. But Abiathar, it says, that he um, escaped. So verse 21, Abiathar told David that Saul had killed Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Ab Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have brought about the death of every person in your father's household. He says, stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. For you are safe with me. So the one that got away, um, David, you just hear, you, you hear just his um, almost grieving in this and taking responsibility and saying, I have brought about the death of every person because he saw Doeg there. He knew in his spirit that he would go back and tell, and he's taking this responsibility. And I love this, that he's not only saying, oh, I feel so bad, but he's saying, hey, I feel bad. You know, I, I man, I knew it. I knew it then. You stay with me and I'll, I'll keep you, you know, I'll, I'll help keep you safe. You stick with me because they're after me. Now they're after you, so let's come together and let's be with each other and let's, you know, let's work together and, and walk this out and doing the right thing, staying together, you know, um, being committed and, and just, again, this friendship. David's all about friendships and just building these real bonds with people, these real committed, faithful, genuine bonds with people. I love that. I love this connection that he he goes after, he isn't striving for, but he receives them. He sees them when the Lord places that opportunity, places people in his life. So that's that. We're leaving um, or finishing those two chapters with that. Our reading, we just see again the anger, those poor decisions of Saul that all just stem from, you know, jealousy that we're like, oh, it's no big deal. Uh, it's a big deal. And we see that. We see that in there. If you are jealous of a person, if you're comparing yourself to a person, we see what our flesh can cause us to do. We see how intense it can be. We see how destructive it can be. And yes, a lot of people are getting hurt, but think of Saul. Think of the position he's in, just stuck, just just, just stuck and bound in these feelings of, of restlessness, constantly just fighting, constantly against him, this heaviness upon him where he's in fear and he feels like he has to, you know, he has to have David kill, this desperation, this just, that's a life I don't want to live. And guys, that all stems from disobedience, not repenting, and then jealousy on someone else who maybe is repenting, who is living life well, who is making, you know, they're making right decisions. The Lord is with them. It's, it all stems from something simple. It's not that Saul was born a horrible man that, that you know, was destined to be a murderer. It's step by step of bad decisions, of bad choices, one thing after another that's not taken care of. May we receive the blessing of conviction and the second that we hear, hey, you, you've done wrong. Hey, you need to repent. Hey, this isn't right. Hey, this is, you know, this is going to cause some issues within you. Hey, this is going to hurt other people. The second we feel that conviction, the second that we hear that conviction from the spirit, may we respond to that. May we listen. May we not push it aside. Oh, we don't want to hear it. Oh, we don't want to deal with it. May we listen to it. May we respond. May we walk in obedience so that, that those things in our lives can be utterly destroyed and we can give God room and space to, to change things up within us, to clear it out so that, that instead of shame, we could feel grace. And instead of, of this pain and this jealousy, we could find contentment and satisfaction in who we are in the Lord. That's where it's at. So, um... That's all I got. Thanks for walking these two chapters out with me. There's so much more to come. So let's keep walking this out and journeying together. And His Word Unveil, just digging in the truths of the Lord and letting Him unveil that truth and the power and beauty in that um, to us. Thanks for walking this out. Hope to see you soon in my next video. See ya.